Robotics and Humanities series. We are very excited about having this here at All Souls. And before we begin, I just wanted to say a couple of words about All Souls. For those of you who have been here before and might be interested, we are an interfaith religious organization. If you look around the walls, you can see the symbols of all the world's faiths. We have two services, a meditation and prayer service on Sunday mornings at 9, and at 5 o'clock is our main service with choir and music and speakers from different faiths around the world and people who are interested in the area. This lady has spoken for us once and gave a very good talk. So now I am going to turn you over to Tom and Tom Denver, and he's going to introduce our speakers. But in the meantime, if you want to know more about us, there are pamphlets out in the lobby after us. Thank you, Mary, and thank you, everyone, for coming. When I walked out of my office and realized um, just how warm it was, I was a little uh, <laughs> suspect that we were going to get a crowd here today, so I'm so impressed um, that everyone turned out um, for what is going to be a really wonderful um, uh, hour of conversation about the upcoming exhibition and its uh, meaning in this question that we've been exploring this spring on uh, robotics and humanity. Uh, many of you may have received an email that Aubrey Schick, unfortunately, is stranded in Pittsburgh at the airport and could not make the connection. Um, we are so sorry. We're going to try to reschedule her um, for later in the season, and we'll get the word out um, to as many as we can. It'll be on our website, certainly. Um, and uh, by all means, uh, we, will, uh, we will try to rearrange that, because her presentation on sort of these helper robots that she's been coming up with, I think, is a really fundamental um, point of promise that we all hope this technology holds as we move into the 21st um, century. Um, as I mentioned last week, we are in a glorious structure. Um, I'm so impressed with this building. I think it's a beautiful place to gather and talk about the role of um, society and technology. And again, I'd like to thank All Souls and Mary Abley for making it available. I'd like to thank Shelburne Farms for co-sponsoring this, along with All Souls and Shelburne Museum. I think this is a wonderful example of what organizations can do in a community when you band together to come up with an interdisciplinary topic that is of interest um, to all of us. And this is something that the museum is really committed, um, committed to doing. I'm very pleased that we're all sponsoring this together. I'm very pleased that the exhibition this summer at the museum is Time Machines, Robots, Rockets, and Steampunk. And we're going to hear a lot about that um, from our uh, panelists today. I want to thank um, the Alma Gibbs Duction Foundation and media support from WRUT <coughs> for this lecture series. Um, we always want to thank our sponsors um, because that is how we make these um, programs possible and available to our public. I would like to introduce Fran Stoddard, who, as I say, needs very little introduction. Um, Fran has been involved with education and media production for some time. Some time. Uh, we, we eliminated the, the number. Um, she has been a producer host of a number of television and radio programs and often serves as a moderator for panels like this, community groups, and educational um, endeavors like this one um, with our three, um, um, three organizations here in Shelburne. She has served on a number of nonprofit boards and understands um, how we serve um, our community. So I'm so pleased that she's here. Thank you again for doing thank this. Thank you, Tom. Um, and I would also like to thank our pinch hitters. Um, we found out at about 11 o'clock today that they were <laughs> to go home and put, uh, put their Sunday finest on. Um, so Corey Rogers uh, is our curator of design arts at the Shelburne Museum. Many of you have come to his exhibitions. Corey has been the one who has been uh, staging these wonderful historical mashups of the last few years um, and is doing such a fantastic job. And his all-star curatorial fellow, Sarah Woodbury, uh, who joins us. Sarah is a graduate of the Williams Master's mm -hmm. Program in Art History um, and has organized a wonderful exhibition uh, this summer for, um, for the museum uh, as well. And again, they will be discussing the objects that they've been bringing to Shelburne, um, to Vermont, to help us explain uh, time machines, robots, robotics, and steampunk. So thank you all. Thank you, Tom. Um, I also, before we get started, just wanted to thank the remarkable uh, collaborators who chose to pursue this series, which was rather courageous. You know, not only is it a collaboration um, of three uh, wonderful organizations, um, but it's also pretty curious. People have come up to me and said, robots? <laughs> really? 
Um, it's really interesting, though, as people found out last week, and I think you'll find out today. But I do want to thank, again, um, sitting down with Mary Abley, uh, Lisa Desmond, who manages this space, uh, Karen Peterson, the head of education at Shelburne, and Caitlin Ziegler, the adult programs coordinator who did the legwork to really pull this whole thing together and conducted preliminary research. It was really a remarkable team and so much fun to have the discussions about what is this going to be about and what does it mean and can we really talk about humanity and robots and nature and, and, some, and spirituality and somehow come up with something that's going to be interesting and um, those conversations alone prove to us there's something here. There's something very interesting here. So uh, we, we, went, we went forward. And it's great having, you know, Corey Rogers who, um, he's been at the museum since uh, 2004 and I um, have been told by others that he's one of the many treasures there. So it's great to have <laughs> you here. And, and he was, like, he brought that motorcycle show, the paperwork show last year, curated that, a lot of the circus uh, program. So um, wonderful to have Corey here and um, actually to bring him out from wherever they keep him there. <laughs> <laughs> Under a rock. <laughs> and get to talk to him. And um, just one extra thing um, about Sarah, it's great to have her here. She also um, did intern, internships at the Dallas Museum of Art and the National Museum of Wildlife Art in Wyoming before she was snagged by the Shelburne <laughs> Museum uh, for this curatorial fellowship. Um, so let's get started. So this is, you know, this, here's a cute little robot. It's really too bad that Aubrey wasn't here. I talked to her. She creates robots that um, are, do wonderful things. And it will be fun when, when she comes here um, to, share her work with you because it's really about robots that are actually interfacing with people in need and without that ro that robot can do more for say children with autism than a, a human being can on some on some levels so it's it's pretty remarkable work and very exciting but now we're back to this thing and one of the things we discovered last week was that robots and creating figures that look like us but aren't really, um, et cetera, have been a part of our legacy for thousands of years, mm -hmm. actually. So what was the inspiration, though, for you to, to have this show? It's called Time Machines, Robots, Rockets, and Steampunk. What, what drove you toward this? Uh, the genesis for the exhibition really was born out of a single collector who wants to remain anonymous and that we met mm -hmm. out in Oberlin, Ohio. And he was amassing this spectacular collection of 10 robots, toys from the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and even up into the present day. But he also had this amazing collection of space-related toys. And the um, objects in his space collection, we got to looking at them, and we saw this um, dynamic uh, association between the robots and the, the space uh, toys. And mainly, it was that people's idea of the future changed at different times. And we wanted to see what it was about what was going on culturally um, that really changed the perception of what fantasy was. And Sarah can talk to, about this a little bit more, but for example, when Sputnik in 1957 was launched into the air, you would noticed that the toys that were previous were very fantastical. They had nothing to do with anything based in reality. But after 1957, when the ra space race really began, um, you see that we're starting to look more at the available technologies of the time. You can probably so yeah. So what, what? How did the vision of the future change? Oh, it's an excellent question that you ask. And first of all, uh, can everyone hear me all right? You know, to invoke that awful cliche, that cell phone commercial. Can you hear me now? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Well, the span of time that we're looking at really dates from about the 1930s up through about the 1960s. And just in terms of the economic environment, that changed radically. Mm -hmm. And the earliest toys we're looking at, this is the midst of the Great Depression. Uh, mm -hmm. Economics are really low. You have really high unemployment rates. Does this sound a bit familiar? <laughs> and uh, basically, the more dismal your reality is, the more fantastical your alternate realities become. And this is where we have these, these wonderful characters such as Buck Rogers and Flash Gordon who are living in these far off worlds in far distant times in these incredibly outlandish ships and costumes and colors and they're just really fantastic. 
But as Corey had pointed out earlier, they're not necessarily based in anything especially scientific. I mean, there was an interest in science fiction at the time, but honestly, the majority of the public did not really think that space travel was all that conceivable. And I mean, why should it be? You only had basic testings for rockets going on, primarily in Germany. Some work going on in the United States, but it really wasn't all that well known. And then you come to this event of Sputnik, 1957, a really seminal moment in terms of launching what is now known as the space race. Why? Well, because for years, the Americans had kind of become content with the ideas like, oh, those poor Soviets, they're so backward, they'll never be able to uh, <laughs> beat us at anything. Look at all of this. I mean, this is post-World War II. This is a time of abundance and all this wealth coming through that you never had available in the 30s. It's this time of consumption and reveling in the pleasures of today and so forth. And then out of nowhere, this Sputnik goes shooting across with that distinctive little pain sound. And that <laughs> just sent everyone on a roll. It's like, all right, that's it. Now we have to go into space. And as Corey pointed out earlier, you start to see the toys lining up with what's going on in reality. Because in the 30s, you didn't really have all that much going on in terms of actual rocket launching and testing and exploration. I mean, you did, but it was only to an ex you know, a limited extent. Whereas post-1957, that's when you have NASA, that's when you have Gemini, Mercury, the Apollo programs. And now, suddenly, the reality, in a lot of ways, is more fantastical than what you could ever imagine. Because now, the thought of actually reaching the moon, it's suddenly feasible. And that's, that's a pretty mind-blowing concept when you stop to think about it. So the toys are changing and, and other things? What's, what's, exactly. What is changing in, in the world that you are looking at? The main thing with the toys is that they really are starting to mirror what's going on in terms of the actual NASA program. So you have the replicas of, and the, of astronauts. You know, the Gemini rockets or the Apollo launches or so forth. And you also have less emphasis on these more distant, fantastical worlds and more play sets centered on say, Cape Canaveral, or Cape Kennedy, as it was known at the time, and uh, also just the Apollo landings. Well, it, it takes me to wonder, last week we talked a lot about fantastic worlds and people living in Second Life and um, in these video games. Is there something about tough times that takes people to a more fantastical place where when things are going well, things are more based in reality, or am I just leaping somewhere? I definitely think there's a tendency to retreat into the world of fantasy when things aren't going your way in the world. And um, I think that that has a benefit in that once things kind of pick up, then you have the inspiration to move forward and create new things. So mm -hmm. I think that it's kind of a healthy process that, that's going on there. So in other words, we get ideas about, say, robots. Exactly. And, and how they actually might become some kind of reality. Um, the other thing I was interested in is you, Sarah, have also put together a show about how this relates to the permanent collection. Oh, yes. So can you speak to that? And then, and then we'll actually get back to, to robots. Oh, <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, basically, when I was uh, asked to do this show, I was told, more or less, can you do a show on robots with the permanent collection but without the robots? So, all right, all right, I'll see what I can do with that. So what I'm looking at here is I'm t all the objects come entirely from the permanent collection. So if nothing else, it should emphasize the fact that our holdings are very eclectic. So there's really something for everybody. Mm -hmm. But I was looking more at the creative drive that you see that is shared in all of the sections going on in the Time Machines exhibit and also in the permanent collection. This desire to explore new places or to seek out novelty or find new identities in time travel and so forth. So many of the objects I've chosen, for example, concern travel to distant or exotic countries or places. I thought that was the closest counterpart to what's going on in space travel. Then I have other pieces that deal with more what I would call domestic novelties, robots themselves. If you have a little Roomba going around your room, that's kind of a novelty in itself. <laughs> I don't have to vacuum. Whereas in the 19th century, the equivalent that I found in our permanent holdings were exotic fashions or new technologies, uh, synthetic dyes and so forth being introduced into hmm. clothing. So you're focusing on the 18th and 19th century. 18th and 19th century is really what's what, what collection. our collection is especially strong yeah. in. Yeah. Yes. So getting back to what you brought in for this show, um, which I assume 
Well, I guess it's 30s to 60s. Does it does it stop there? Is it is it anything more? Well, there are recent other components that? to the exhibition. There are there's the rockets, the space exploration, which is really the 30s through the 60s. Yeah, that, that it, and the pinnacle really is the moon landing. Mm -hmm. I got it. And then there's the robot section of the exhibition, which really looks at from the 1940s up until the present day. Uh -huh. And then we have another section about steampunk, and I don't know if any of you are aware what steampunk is. It's this, we'll alternate re it. <laughs> it's this alternate reality, and basically it's Victorian futurism. It's where people customize the way that they live, their lives, whether it be their home furnishings, their apparel, or um, electronic gadgets. They all customize them to have this very Victorian aesthetic. And so, so that's weird enough, but we'll get there in a minute. Yeah, so, 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 so but, but I, what I was trying to say there is that it's always about our perception of reality at the time and what was going on in science fiction. So here we're looking back to the future in the sense that right. they're looking at Victorian aesthetic but adapting it to their lives today. So that's where yeah. the term time machine comes from, is these objects through imagination are able to transport you through different places and times. Right. Huh. So speaking of places and times, mm -hmm. I'm kind of, I'm trying to absorb all this because this, <laughs> this is pretty new to me as well. Where do these come from? They, don't ju they aren't fr just from the United States. Uh, no, uh, a lot of the toys, especially especially the um, tin toys, the early tin toys, were made and man manufactured, excuse me, in occupied Japan. We were mm -hmm. talking about this a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. Right after World War II, the U.S. government came in, the military, and they asked the decimated tin manufacturers of Japan to convert to producing toys for American and Western consumption. And that's why you have this great proliferation of tin toys that are being manufactured in Japan and sold abroad. Now, would those be called automatons or are those something separate? I automatons, I think, are a little bit more complex, I would say, and maybe a different scale. Um, you know, we have an amazing collection of 19th century automata, which are basically these very complicated uh, very uh, complicated for the time and very unsophisticated by today's standards um, in terms of their inner workings, but they um, produce these very rote, very short um, movements and uh, were made primarily for the entertainment of adults, whereas mm -hmm. these were made, manufactured as toys to be played with by children, the robots. So Sarah, what's the difference between an automaton and a robot? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, <laughs> well, we can toss it out to I'm the audience. I'm glad you her way. Because <laughs> I mean, we were talking about they're trying to make robots that are, you know, self-replicating, for example, or are sentient. But they, although Jim Ollinger, who is from RETN, who has slipped out, just told me today, I'm sorry, this is an aside, but he said, because he was here part of last week, he said, you know, they just on the BBC announced this morning that there's a self-propelled jellyfish that runs on hydrogen. It can, it can live in the water forever, and it is a created being that will last forever. So that was interesting. <laughs> but anyway, back to... Where can I get uh, one of those? <laughs> <laughs> Not that it has a purpose or can do anything, but we are seeming at the dawn of something kind of different. Um, so, you want to take a, a, a stab at, at that automaton, which actually, does it just do one thing and a robot is able to do, make choices about doing several things, perhaps? Well, the interesting thing that you bring up in terms of the terminology, and one thing I've discovered working on this show, is how many uh, different uh, perspectives of definition can arise mm. from any one term. Uh, you can take the etymological one, you can take a cultural one. And even today, with our changing technologies, our perception of what a thing is, uh, whether it's a cyborg or an automata or whatnot, could be very different from what we imagine. Uh, I just read an article the other day, for example, just to distract you a little bit while I mull over automata <laughs> yet a little more. I was uh, thinking... <laughs> Didn't know that would be the trick question. Oh, no, 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 no. This is what, this is what makes it interesting. Uh, no, I was reading an article the other day about the concept of the cyborg. When we think of hmm. cyborgs, we think, oh, probably the Borg off of Star Trek, where you have this literal fusion of man and flesh. Mm -hmm. Whereas this particular article I was reading was arguing that, well, no, it's actually the internet that's the cyborg. And if you mm. think of physical matter being something beyond that which you can just merely touch, then the internet by far is the largest thing out there and we are all connected to it, either through Facebook or our email accounts or our Android phones and so forth. So tying down one specific, you know, to get back to your question in a very roundabout way, um, 
it's difficult to ascribe any one particular definition to any term such as robot or automata because the technology itself can radically change what our concept of it is. Personally, when I think of automata, I think of, again, these 19th century adult toys, basically. Uh, but that's a very limited historical kind of definition. Robot itself also has an interesting etymological history. It originally derives from a Czech or a Serbian word, which means a servitude. Yeah. So it doesn't even necessarily refer to mechanical parts or automation, but derives from the idea of, again, this servant concept, right. which becomes very prevalent in robotic literature. Which even what Isaac Asimov has his, his three, three robotics. Yeah. Exactly. So do you want to talk about that, about how they really should serve us? Well, it's interesting. If any Except of you have ever read, one. yeah, exactly. Go ahead. If you've ever read um, Isaac Asimov's work, I Robot, it's a really interesting and really easy read. And what he's done, and what I appreciate the most, this is just kind of an aside, is his ability to discuss and communicate very eloquently and intelligently a uh, very complex subject matter, but in a way that everyone read it, who reads it can get it. And it's even in the acronyms that become the names of the robots. You know, he, t he describes exactly what their duties were, and it's like Sonny or Rob or whatever. It's a robot who moves boulders or something like that. Um, but what he did was he came up with these three laws, and basically the laws were that um, robots could not har harm humans. Um, robots could defend themselves, but they couldn't defend themselves if um, it meant harming a human. So basically, the entire book is about the discussion on how do humans relate to robots? Are they going to take all of our jobs? So they were restricted to working only in outer space, so in, in, in conditions that humans couldn't work in safely. And um, there's one of my favorite passages in the book is a discussion between a robot who has no concept of Earth. He wasn't activated on Earth, and he's activated in space. And when the um, humans who control him, or supposedly control him, we're trying to explain to him, we made you. You are a product of us. He comes back with this really amazing defense, and he says, no, the argument that you're telling me is false. You are made out of perishable organic materials. You have to have fuel every t so many hours. You have to have eight hours of going into a coma every night. I do not buy your thesis that you are our creator because we are so much more superior than you. And so Isaac Asimov, in these very entertaining um, stories, short stories really, discusses, and it's very, it's, even today, the subject matter is very prescient, discusses the relationship between humans and robots, the potential conflicts that there are there. And in the exhibition, we're gonna address that with using some of the toys to illustrate a whole shelf. The, the toy robots are gonna be exhibited in shelves, these internally lit shelves, and one whole shelf will be based on the story of iRobot and how you can kind of see these themes of the story working through these toys. It's fascinating. So as professionals in the field of art, what about technology is appealing to those interested in art. I mean, why, why is this at a museum? I mean, to, there, the toy factor. But does technology, do, do we back off from technology as artists, or does technology bring something new to the whole field? Well, I think that technology is something that we all have to adapt to. We can't be Luddites and just stick our heads in the sand and pretend like it doesn't happen. And younger generations of people are learning to interface with the world through technology. So if we're going to remain viable sources of information for different generations to come, then we have to embrace this technology. Now that's not to say that I believe we should have apps where people are looking at their smartphones as opposed to looking to the, at the art on the wall, but I do believe that we have to embrace it or we become antiquated and we run that risk of becoming antiquated and no longer of use to our, our public. And there are people making art. Exactly. That, even, in the, even the objects we are collecting nowadays, you can't ignore the aspect of technology. You have digital artists creating videos and so forth. You can have holograms. And it's just that the materials are out there, and we have to adapt to them both not only in terms of remaining relevant, but also learning how to maintain and preserve these things. Uh, that in itself is an ongoing challenge. I mean, it doesn't have to be highfalutin, you know, uh, digital art. We're, we're, we're struggling with these issues internally in the sense that we recently were given the circus photographs from Elliot Fernander that we were on exhibit last year, and we have digital scans, and we're trying to figure out how do we store these, how do we make sure that they're still going to be able to be used, you know, 10 years from into the future, so. 
Do you think Electra Havemeyer Webb would just think this was the coolest thing? I hope or, so. <laughs> I, I, like to think, I, I like to think so myself, just because of its eclecticism. Mm -hmm. And these are objects. She was interested in objects everyday that somehow objects. interacted with everyday life. Mm -hmm. And these robot toys, whether they're projecting our fantasies or paralleling what's going on in space explora exploration and so forth, they are a part of everyday life. She collected toys. We have the, the toy shop, which sure. is a misnomer and I think disappoints a lot of children every time they go there, <laughs> they're going to buy something. But yeah, no, she collected toys. And you know, we have really amazing, beautiful tin clockwork toys from the late 19th century that are somehow related to the, the robots. Well, let's talk about steampunk, because it really is a very interesting movement. And why now? And even with the film Hugo, and there's just, <laughs> If any of you have seen that, it just took me there, because these are people that are fascinated by that era and steam and clocks and, but, uh, well, yeah. Um, let us in. I mean, I do have one quote from Jay Strongman, sure. but let's, let's hear yours first. And well, <laughs> I, I, Sarah and I have gone to a lot of these um, conventions that they have for steampunk people, and they come in their regalia, and they're dressed up, and they assume these. Oh, yes kind of alternate personalities, and while I respect that, it is a little bit unnerving sometimes. But um, what this basically is are people who love the Victorian aesthetic, and they want to adapt their lives today to kind of fit that aesthetic. Um, they cite Jules Verne and H.G. Wells as their source of inspiration, you know. And um, so if you can just imagine putting gears, struts, copper, brass on anything you owned, that's basically customizing these objects, that's basically what steampunk is. And they're all very closely connected, but they all came, our experience has been that everyone is working, the artists that we're working with, who is working in the steampunk aesthetic, they all came at it from a different perspective. They didn't say, I'm gonna join steampunk. At some point they just said, oh, you know, I like this aesthetic. If you remember Wild Wild West, the TV yeah. show from the <laughs> 60s, or, and it's kind of that aesthetic, yeah. Well, what is it about the zeitgeist, you think, today that that has become very popular and something that, I mean, I don't know how mainstream it is, but um, certainly there are a lot of artists drawn to this. Well, I think that I can speak for the two of us in this hmm. because we're both huge dorks. Um, <laughs> I think that it's no longer, I think that it's no longer, you don't have to be ashamed of being a sci-fi fan. I mm -hmm. mean, you don't have to, you know, keep it in the closet, if you will. You can be upfront about it and it's kind of cool. And maybe the rise yeah. of the hipster, who knows? That uh, uh, who, who knows? To us, but. I think another reason why people can relate to steampunk too, on just a more general level, is that it really brings out the idea of role play. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. in our own day, even if you consider yourself the most normal human possible, whatever that could be, Not we nice. all play various roles from day to day. You know, we have our working mode where we go, to, we go to the office and we act a certain way and then we go out afterwards uh, to be with our friends and we behave differently and so forth. And uh, movements like steampunk just kind of, they make it more extroverted, but we mm -hmm. all, in different ways, just put on these various masks and so forth. And I think we can connect to it on at least that level. What's well, interesting, this, this gentleman, Jay Strongman, um, who wrote Steampunk, the Art of Victorian Futurism, mm -hmm. he says it's a celebration of Victoria technology, Victorian technology and aesthetics. So that's interesting. It's th that's when you know, steam was the new technology. It's when mm -hmm. a lot of technology really was first coming out. Um, to others, it's about a past that almost was and a future that could have been. Now that's curious. Um, it's My Fair Lady meets the Terminator. It's romantic it's mo and mysterious. It's uh, the world of steam-powered robots and airships of time travelers and parallel universes and all that, you know, H.G. Wells and, and uh, Jules Verne stuff. But it's also kind of about this grimy industrial age. And there's, there's something about what's the future piece that's in steampunk? I think that the future piece is that if you, the people who are, these artists are working in, this world, this fantasy world, and they come up with these really complicated and really almost apocalyptic um, mythologies around these devices. There's a man in the show named Mike Cochran, and what he envisions is a, um, a world that is dominated by this corporate entity that um, somehow wants to mine um, the memories of humans and turn that into some kind of a profitable uh, venture. And so, for example, what he'll have in the show are these sculptures of human skulls with holes in them, kind of like a lobotomy hole, where you can look into and you see the memories of these people. And so he's come up with this whole storyline that talks about that. 
I think in terms of the future, they also you know, look to using ray guns. They use dirigibles that can fly into space. Um, it's a world where innovation is prized and can be used um, as a way of culling power for them. Uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Girl Genius um, book of um, graphic novels series, but it's all a world where um, the world is ruled by these different despotic uh, mad scientists. So it's a darker vision. It can have it can a darker than, undertone, yeah. Say, you know, last week we were looking at all the, the possibilities, and the, the apocalyptic vision was you put your brain in a robot and you will live forever. And kind of these, uh, you know, it was a little bit more cheery than, than what you're talking about. What, so so we've, got these, we've got both of these vis apocalyptic visions, which are very interesting, kind of bring it back to this spiritual realm of time and what's going to happen to us. So what, what are you seeing? Yeah, well, and the other thing I want to emphasize too about steampunk is that this apocalyptic vision is not necessarily universal uh, mm -hmm. within this particular aesthetic. Uh, I mean, the degrees to which people believe in this can vary greatly, just like the extent of their participation can vary greatly. So for some people, it's just, well, I like, I like the way it looks because Victorian stuff looks cool, so I just wear that. <laughs> Whereas other people will look, assume these entire alternative personalities. So I mean, when you describe steampunk, it's really difficult to just kind of put one entire label yeah, on it. It's, you know, it's, like, it's like any art historical movement when you think of it. It's just a convenient uh, title, you know, like whether it's Barbizon School or so forth. It's just a label that we like to put on because we like to categorize things. Mm -hmm. Makes it easier to comprehend. Well, we also seem to like to change history and create our own reality somehow. And it seems that what you're looking at is also speaking to that. <coughs> What, what do we want our world to be or be like? Uh, why, you know, why is the human beings need to go there? What? To rewrite history. Uh, yeah. One of the most interesting, or not most interesting, but one of the interesting aspects of our show is that we're gonna include in the exhibition is a, um, a series of books, or a book that was written called Boilerplate. And Boilerplate is this imaginary robot that was invented in the late 19th century for the World's Fair. Uh, Columbia's World, Columbia World Fair in Chicago, and um, this robot was designed as a way to ha ha produce soldiers that would negate the need for human soldiers. And these artists have gone through and they have produced what looks like a regular textbook that you would see in schools, but they've inserted the robot into all these really major historical events that happen at the time, and he somehow has a way of changing history that way. So there is this historic, historical way of revision, revising history in steampunk. And um, yeah, it's pretty interesting because you see pictures of Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders and there's this robot inserted. And so on one hand, I think it's really, really cool. On the other hand, I'm really concerned that children or people who are less versed in this information uh, will think that this is actual <laughs> truth, you know. So you have to. You're, we're we're playing a fine and, line. And, here. and you know, it also underscores the, the 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 delightful relationship that occurs with steampunk and contemporary technology, because mm. this type of photographic manipulation is really only possible today with Photoshop and other applications that you can get on your computer. So there's really this dialogue between this this uh, fantasizing about the past, but you're taking what's available today to retroactively create an alternative vision. Mm. Well, I'll just ask one more question. This is, um, and then and then I want to um, put it out to the audience. But I'm wondering, can technology help us get beyond kind of our lack of imagination around some? It, it feels like we we go to the past, we go to other places. Is this an opportunity to kind of get us out of away from ourselves? Robots look like us. Uh, even, even the robots that don't look like us are, use hands and do mm -hmm. things like we do. It's like, how do we, can technology actually get us out of ourselves and create something completely new? It's, it's a tricky question. I mean, throughout history, whenever we're trying to comprehend the unknown, we grasp onto familiar conventions to help understand them. Um, so it's not even, so, I mean, technology, yes, it could be there to help us, but it's just a new medium. The real challenge is becoming comfortable with going beyond 
this reliance on conventions. And this is something we've been fighting against for at least the past hundred years. If you mm -hmm. look at modernism in the international style, that was an attempt to get rid of historical decoration and to create a new form of architecture. So the struggle itself is nothing new. It's just we have more gadgets with which to fight against it, if you want to look at it that way. If, if you think that relying on convention is a negative thing. It all depends on your interpretation. Well, if you look at the history of design and you see the introduction of new technology, there's a cycle, especially mm -hmm. with like the television. So what did the early te televisions look like? They put them in furniture cabinets. So they looked like a piece of furniture that you could get used to that kind of blended into your in domestic environment. And then as technology improves, it starts to, the um, form actually starts to follow the function. And so you get these shapes and uh, designs that you wouldn't have conceived of at the time. So I think it's inevitable that we'll go through this cycle and eventually we'll get to a point where we will not make, be making referential, you know, anthropomorphic designs. So interesting. So with that, um, questions. We've, we've brought out a lot of things. They're, they're philosophical <laughs> questions, questions of art and design, questions of who, how we reflect ourselves through technology. Any questions for this crew? Yes. The role playing aspect of steampunk stuff, uh, put that aside. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know about that part. But to me, the aesthetics seem to really speak to a nostalgia of the time when you, know, if you took the cover off something, you could actually see how it worked. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I remember, you know, Agent Underwood type writer, we had, you know, I was always poking around it, you know, if I push the things, I can see how it worked. But if you take the covers off things now, unless you have a PhD in whatever, you, it's a mystery, you know? And it, to me, it kind of speaks to a nostalgia for the time when you could kind of like see how things work. And um, I, that, that to me is the appealing part of the steampunk movement. And you can see the gears work, you can see all that stuff. If you could kind of repeat the question, this is about how the nostalgia piece of steampunk is, is really because you could open something up and see what was there. You could actually touch it and figure it out. Where today there's no way we can figure it's out. It's all circuit what's, boards what's, and what's soldering, going on. yeah. Or as we, as we heard last week, um, one person will not know how a machine works. You need a team. Mm -hmm. One person could never understand that. So um, a very interesting observation about steampunk and what that might mean. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. It's, I, I, I'd like to think from an art historical and design historical pr perspective that this is just a new kind of Victorian revivalism, but it's just a kind of a modern twist on it. Instead of, you know, making bent wood furniture, now we're, we're customizing our iPods to look like a Victorian <laughs> clockwork machine, you know. Now, like what would H.G. Wells play yeah, exactly. his, his iTunes on? <laughs> what would his iTunes be? <laughs> I, think, I think Jules Verne would be more interesting. You think so? Yeah. <laughs> you don't think they had little you know, Martian whiplashes coming out and whipping up songs and putting them in there? Death rays would <laughs> incinerate. Far, yes. So I'm, been, I'm an English teacher and I've been watching the Sherlock mania happen and I'm really excited about that because it's a superhero without superpowers. And as I was listening to you speak, I started to think about the two versions that are very popular, the movie version, which is almost steampunkish in its visuals, and then the BBC production, which incorporates modern technology into this high Victorian character who is far superior and yet is us. I'm wondering if you might address that. Are you seeing that? Do, do you see this as part of this movement where we're going back to all we can count on as people, which is this, and using the rest. I have a question that question. I apologize. It's funny you should mention the uh, 1960s movie. We actually have tracked down a man, a very interesting man, uh, named Carl Pierre Marini, and he has spent five years of his life recreating an exact replica of the time machine from the H.G. Wells movie, uh, book movie inspired by his book, and that's going to be in the exhibition. And I think that, um, I think you're right, that there's something comforting in taking something historical and adapting it to your lives. Um, it's something that's well known. Um, yeah, I think that that's definitely an aspect of it. What do you mean? I think it, it makes it feel relevant. Mm. And 
in terms of your observation about how we ultimately have to rely on ourselves, I think that could be in part perhaps a reaction against a lot of the technology. I mean, whenever you have this stuff developing rapidly, as it is, there is an inherent fear of it. Like, is it getting beyond our control? Maybe we can't trust it and we can only rely on ourselves in the end, at the end of the day. Um, so it could be uh, partly a reactionary thing. Yet it also continues to make it relevant because ironically it's the modern technology, as in the case of Sherlock, that makes it feel contemporary. Uh, so it's this uh, compelling dynamic. And it's also the fight this. scenes too. Oh, well, and the explosions. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. I don't get cable, so I haven't seen it. <laughs> it kind of comes back to this whole um, feeling of being with technology that we can understand in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, back to a time when there was technology that helped us, but it was also somehow more understandable, more reachable. Yes, all the way in the back, Karen. Um, Corinne, Sarah, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit more to the other robots that you have in the show and sort of how they relate to the toys. You talked about the toy collection, oh, no. but it'd be interesting <laughs> to hear about those. Yeah, well, we're looking at kind of, you know, we were all sold by the Jetsons, this concept that we would all go home in the year 2000 to our maid robot who would do everything for us. I'm still um, waiting for my food. I'm waiting for flying cars, too. <laughs> and. Um, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at kind of the current state of robots that were available on the mass market. And so we, you know, we look at like Rosie the robot who was a maid who would back in your house. We have Roombas, right? We have um, robotic lawnmowers will be in the exhibition. But there's also the concept and kind of more appealing to me, kind of the frightening concept of robots is that sometimes they can turn against us is the idea, concept of killer robots, which have been important in science fiction through you know, uh, history or the history of science fiction. And um, so we have an actual killer robot. This is a robot, I don't know if you've ever seen it on the Discovery Channel, but there's a show called Killer Robots. And it's this gladiatorial game where these robots are designed to do nothing but destroy their opponent. And it's nothing but blades and hacksaws. It's and fantastic. It's really yeah, glorious. Yeah. 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 I mean, the Romans would love this. Sarah and, I, Sarah and I love that we get paid to watch this stuff at work. Um, but we have we, we found what I think he's the most winning Something robot like that. champion yes. of the world called Last Rites, and um, he's this big blade, and we have videotape of him in action, just like decimating, completely destroying his competition. Um, so there will be stuff like that. And actually, out of last week's talk, someone in the audience contacted us about a local, is it Essex High School? Yes. 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 They, um, they, they are going to go on to, uh, we're, and we're going to talk about this next week, actually, with John Abley, because he's connected with them. They have um, won a certain degree to go on to um, Kansas City mm -hmm. and compete there. I'm not sure if it's killer. But it's, it's not killer. killer. <laughs> it's not killer, it's but win. Yeah, yeah, no. Somehow. <laughs> no, but, but we're looking at the possibility of putting that in the exhibition. Oh, and it's great, nice yeah. that it was something that was born out of this discussion. Right. Fantastic. And just to relate the robots back to the space section of the show, just to show that there is some sort of idea of continuity going on through here. <laughs> <laughs> You're not supposed to highlight these things. Oh, come on. <laughs> just as the space toys there kind of contrast pre-1957 conceptions of the future with the space race and toys that mm -hmm. seem more realistic, if you want to put it, mirroring what's actually going on in real time in the space program, so the robot section, you have the toys of the past of this fantastical future of your maid robot and so forth, and then you have today and what's available. So to invoke that overused phrase, our future is now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There are some more questions over here. Yeah. Um, can you talk about, or I'm sure you have stuff designing where you're in the process of making things for Owl Cottage, but I'm wondering about how interactive the exhibit is. Are you involving? technology for people with smartphones or QR codes or you know whatever we, else we, we you know we tend to keep it very simple just because of it's a lot of it's a lot of um, technical requirements it's a lot of you know hands-on requirements but we are making uh, some working with, along with our education department on some fun interactive aspects of the show there will be a lot of video in the exhibition there are some uh, steampunk robots that are interactive in that you walk up to them, they have motion sensors, they kind of activate, and um, so there will be that aspect of it. Um, in 
uh, there will also be these photo booths, which I'm really jazzed about. Um, Hannah Weissman um, has come up with this idea of allowing people to come in and kind of dress yourselves up, take your iPhone and snap a picture of yourself standing on the moon, you know, in some kind of spaceman out suit or in some steampunk airship. So. Yeah, I mean, what better way to emphasize the role play aspect exactly. than to do it yourself? <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Other questions? <clears throat> thought I saw some over here. Yes? I think you're talking about kind of to think about the drones that we hear about the unmanned, unmanned aircraft that come out of there. It's kind of comforting, kind of scary. Do you see those as robots or kind of connected to what you're talking about? Steampunk and the. Yeah, I, I do see them as robots, um, but they're more manually manipulated. You know, and, and that's a thing that you see, especially in the toys of the 1950s and 60s, you see robots where humans are inserted interiorly and they are the ones who are manipulating the robot. So basically it's an extension of a machine for human you know, work. Um, so I do consider drones to be robotic and because they're remotely controlled and very sophisticated yeah. pieces of technology. Yes. They're doing, yeah, I think there's you know, medical uh, things. There are, mm -hmm. Uh, they're doing amazing things, and there's this whole piece about cars that drive them, themselves, which, when you first hear about that, sounds horrible. <laughs> and then you think about it again, would you rather have somebody drunk behind the wheel or a robot mm -hmm. driving you home? I don't know. Yes? Well, I, I was going to comment on the medical thing that robotics would sell a human power. I mean, they're not going in and willy-nilly making the decision that a skilled surgeon doing things, but having the ability, the finer, fine-tuned ability of robots to get it in little places without massive cutting away of things. And as far as the car, think, think about the car that can park itself in a parallel parking spot, I really <laughs> Well, especially in the medical realm, you know, they're looking at nanotechnologies, and I don't know if anyone has heard about this, but there's new cancer research where they're trying to develop these little nanites that target cancer cells and then that can attach themselves made out of, I think it's gold, and then can be heated up with these ultrasonic sounds that will only kill the cancerous tissue. So that's amazing and it's something that's being done right now. And speaking of the cars, I was shocked. I'm originally from Oklahoma, not the most progressive state in the world, but I was shocked to see that Oklahoma has signed up to be one of the states where they can use, test these robotic cars. Yeah. So, there must have been a tax break or something. Like that. <laughs> or big stretches of road. <laughs> Just one or two other questions. Yeah. Um, are you, do you uh, anticipate other discussion groups or something in the evening or? Um, you know, you mentioned, and I'm just thinking about, you mentioned Isaac Asimov's Three Labs of, of Robotics, but most of this stuff going on, you know, the, the killer robots, the drones, none of these, you know, that's not even in the design conversation at all. And so, you know, about ethics and robotics. Um, yeah. It's funny, ethics, you know, we were including some examples of robots that are children. And I don't know if anyone has seen AI. This was kind of the modern version of uh, Pinocchio. And basically, it talks about the ethical issues of creating a child robot that would be dependent upon a parent. As the parent ages and passes away, what happens to the child who's frozen in that state? So there are, you're right, there are a whole lot of ethical considerations that you know, we haven't addressed today. Um, our education department, uh, maybe Karen can speak more to this about the programming about discussions and such. Sure, I was, I was going to say we do have two sunsets evenings planned this summer, one really focusing on robotics for and, and that would be sort of broadly popular in terms of for families as well as adults. And then we'll also be having a steampunk evening. And while I'm not, while we're working on the specifics of the program, of the specific programming for those evenings, that's, I think that's great if we are thinking about both bringing in speakers and having the opportunity to have some sort of more active engagement. So, thanks. So, uh, the Shelburne Museum uh, for the people on RITN will be having some discussions on robotics in general, and also on steampunk uh, coming up this summer uh, at some point. Do you have a question? So anything else about just the, um, you know, you kind of bring up the ethics of all of this. I don't know, as a, as a design person, just in, in finishing since we are in this space, um, as you were pulling these together or talking to the artists, 
what ethical issues did come up or did you think about? Are there connections with the natural world or with the spiritual world that you ran up against as you were designing the show? Well, for me, specifically because I'm dealing with the steampunk section, there is this very militaristic kind of thread that runs through the steampunk mm -hmm. mythologies, the various mythologies. And some of it skirts on totalitarianism and um, can get into fascism. And so we decided not to go into that because we didn't feel like that was a subject that was germane to the topic at hand. But um, there were you know, some considerations about material. What do we include? What do we not include? And we really, especially with the robotics section, we wanted to make the discussion and the connection between these toys, the way they relate to our lives, and the ethical questions of you know, the creation of uh, alternate, alternative life forms. The, creation of life. Exactly. And uh, so we'll be dealing with that. I think for the kids, it'll be beautiful and fun to see these really amazing toys. And I think for the adults, the information and the labels will be more um, substantive for them. Mm. So. Well, I want to thank all of you for coming on this absolutely gorgeous evening. There will be some refreshments um, just out here to continue to enjoy it. I'd like to thank Corey Rogers and Sarah Woodbury, who put together um, this uh, remarkable show, Time Machines, Robots, Rockets, and <coughs> Steampunk. Um, next week, John Abley will be here, I am sure. <laughs> <laughs> he's away today, but I think he'll make it back here. Um, he's, for those of you that, that might not be familiar with him, he is the uh, retired founding chairman of Boston Scientific, one of the most brilliant um, men I have spoken with um, in the past. I think he holds personally about two dozen patents. Boston Scientific, of course, has tens of thousands, I think. Um, he now helps kids become better human beings through working with robots. So he is very aligned with technology and where it is taking us, where it can take us, what it means. He also is very interested in collaboration and how we can get to a much higher level of um, understanding on all kinds of um, things. So I, I recommend you return next week um, to our conversations, thanks to the Shelburne Museum, Shelburne Farms, and All Souls. Thank you so much. <laughs>